We've been hearing a lot today about the changing role of marketing. We, as I mentioned, the CEO of Hiscox uh, from the R&D research with finance, marketing responsibility, how it's more widely distributed across business now, um, and the whole how metrics are put in place. I'm wondering from you how you see the future of brands, particularly as we, in light of that presentation we've just had. Yeah, I, look, I think it's a, it's a fascinating uh, time to basically be in the industry that we're in because now more than ever, I think consumer expectation is an all-time high and is constantly getting reset. And as we, as we heard, one of the things we really need to find a way to do is connect these brands to consumers in meaningful ways when perhaps in times gone by, the brand competition at the level that it exists today didn't. So I think the role of brands is ever more important. Right? I think how you go about actually building that relationship with the consumer is exponentially more complex. And I think how you go about sustaining that relationship over a period of time, and particularly building a, a relationship of trust, as we've seen uh, you know, in, in recent times, uh, you know, constantly getting challenged. So from my perspective, I think brand is, is, importance is an all-time high. The ability to land brands in the minds of consumers is, uh, is a lot harder to it's do. It's interesting that you mentioned the word trust, because I think what, one thing I've learned today from listening to everyone is about, and just thinking about how I engage with brands, is it's that emotional connection For sure. that's really important, and that you can't underestimate the fact that everyone's trying to emotionally connect with me sure. as a consumer. So how do you differentiate yourself, but also how do you then know to ride the wave you know, of a trend that seems to be working. Yeah, I, look, I think for me, there's a lot of value in, in what a brand stands for and its purpose and its authenticity. And I think people more and more are tuning into the fact that the brand is being authentic to itself, living its purpose. And I think that's actually coming back to the fore in a much more meaningful way. But I also think there's another big shift, uh, which I think has been developing over a long period of time which is the experience is the brand and the brand is the experience. So no longer am I comfortable with just being told about you as a brand and your uh, you know, fantastic communication, but what I experience as a consumer now starts to define more and more my belief system in you as a company. And, and, and those interactions are far more frequent and far more iterative in building up my perception or taking away from a brand. So what uh, about marketing communications then? Has that dropped down in terms of um, well, well, it's necessity? In, it, well, I think it's interesting, right? Because I think in the traditional sense, I think the brand story or the brand narrative used to be thought about in the context of being told, Yes. right? But I actually think today, from a consumer's point of view, that brand story is more being lived, is being experienced. And that living the brand story, to me, is actually part of that same communications arc or communications narrative, but is actually communicating through what you experience as opposed to simply telling you something. So I think in the traditional sense, right, I mean, you take the classical example of the airline that shows you, you know, a child sleeping and, you know, somebody gently pulling the blanket over them to suggest warmth and caring and comfort. Of course, that gives you a sense of perhaps what that airline stands for. But then, you know, when your data gets hacked or your bag gets lost and, uh, or you're trying to check in and the boarding pass won't appear on your mobile app, those interactions create as much dissonance with that idea as, as anything. And then actually, uh, my argument personally, personally for me is I would tend to believe that about a company, that which I experience, far more than simply just what I'm told. So then... Again, it kind of goes back to the marketing is almost less important if the fundamentals of the company aren't working. So, how do, so what does the relationship then become between the marketing department and the fundamentals of the company? Yeah, well, see, this is actually the thing, right? I think for the <coughs> longest time, marketing departments were kind of constructed in the context of we do the real thing, we run the company, you simply tell the story. And if the story and the real thing have some significant dissonance between it, tell a better story but just leave us to actually continue doing whatever it is that we were doing. And I think more and more now, progressive marketing departments are starting to realize that the purpose and the narrative of the company has to be experienced and lived by consumers every day. 
and no longer can that cognitive dissonance between what I'm being told and what I experience allowed to perpetuate. So my experience is marketeers are going one of two ways. One way is getting significantly more influential in companies and taking on roles that historically might not have been considered marketing roles. They're becoming champions of the voice of the customer in these organizations. They're starting to influence product strategies. They're starting to influence the business at its core, representing and still championing that very important voice, i.e. the customer. But in another way, I can definitely see where marketing isn't taking that positioning. It becomes simply a vehicle to be reduced to this one aspect, which is communications, tell this story. You know, these are the people who run the company, you simply tell this story. And I think that model will, will, will really challenge both the marketeers and the company and the company overall, because I'm a firm believer in the, the consumer out there wants to understand your story, but they also want to make sure that that story is authentic and isn't something that they don't experience on a day-to-day -day basis with every interaction. How do you make the consumer understand the story when it's being told the story in so many di on so many different platforms? I, I think that's a I think that's a really good question because I actually think you, you've got the you've got the traditional media channels of communication, you've got the channels that the company is using to interact with the consumer, and then you've got perhaps some of the other social channels that are basically you know kind of allowing consumers to form a perspective with your company, and and I think. From my perspective, the, the thinking has got to be very much about what is the story line or narrative that sits across all of these channels that essentially is best suited to identify what message it's, it's, it's really well positioned to communicate. So I almost think about it as almost like a system. So if you're thinking about a story line told through a traditional 30 second spot, I think that's fantastic. But expand that storyline to basically say, how does it live and exist across all of the different touch points? So when I go to a website and the website is you know, really functional and easy to use, does that make me believe that you are a company that's easy to do business with as opposed to that being something that you, know, you talk about in your annual report as one of the core values of the company? And, and that might be a CEO communication in an annual report. It might be an you know, a piece of communication, like a 30 second spot, it might be, you know, how is that value essentially being lived? But how do you do that when you have a wide range of customers who not only receive information from different platforms, but want different stories, have different priorities? Well, I think this, this is, I think, where it comes down to knowing what you stand for as a brand and what your primary focus or, or relationship is to your customers. I think this is where the role of brand becomes increasingly critical, knowing what you stand for, knowing what your purpose is, knowing what your reason to exist in that customer's life is. And I think a lot of you know, businesses um, today you know, sometimes lose the thread on their reason to exist. So, you know, the thing that I think about as a customer, if I just put myself, you know, you know, outside of the kind of day job that I do, and I ask myself, which of these companies would I really be upset about if they disappeared tomorrow? I.e., what is their purpose in my life? And today, more and more, with the ability to make that story personal to me, companies are expected to step up to this idea of basically saying, sure, I need to stand for something, but I need to understand Nigel as a consumer. I need to understand what channels he's on, what, how and where he consumes content, and I need to find a way to get the right message to him at the right time in order to hold my place in, in his life. And that might also stretch beyond just the messaging. It might be through everything that I do and, and interact with the brand as a, as a customer. Going up the chain, it was interesting talking to the CEO of Hiscox because he obviously understands the marketing side and is now the CEO. Mm -hmm. Do you think the CEOs, the management board, get that they need to know how they pitch their company? Oh, I think absolutely. Do you think they're seeing now beyond the numbers? I, I absolutely think they are seeing beyond the numbers because you know, increasingly, Customers are demanding that of companies. You know, essentially, a company simply performing well isn't a good enough reason why I should, you know, do business with them or or, or pick them over all of the alternatives that are available. But I think the how you do it is a hell of a lot harder than knowing that you should do it. So, are the conversations changing then that you're having or, or that your team is having? With, with the client? Uh, absolutely. Uh, every, every conversation I'm in with a, with a CEO, with a CMO, with a CIO, you know, folks are trying to figure out how to build cross-functional teams, how to leverage 
things that were historically done in this department connect to things that were historically done in that department because they're starting to realize that the customer isn't thinking about this is the product division, that's the marketing division, this is the service division. And the service division of the, division of this company is really bad, but the products are great and the marketing is average. They're starting to think about their journey through all of those divisions in a single day with that company, forming an aggregate opinion of whether this business actually is able to deliver things to them in the way that they expect today. And I think if you look at um, a lot of the disruption, the technology and changing business models and changing consumer behavior has driven in a lot of com companies today. I think management teams are really trying to grapple with the fact that those silos, which essentially were the window into the world uh, of the company and a consumer, and you only have to go to a company's website to kind of get a sense of what that looks like to, you know, from an end consumer perspective, are now starting to break down in, in everyday customer journey cycles at a consumer level. And those customers are touching each of those pieces that historically could pass the baton in a very linear fashion to say, we built a great product, now you market it. And once you market it and lots of people are using it, these people will make sure that that product is serviced. Those things are happening in iterative cycles in a, in a very short period of time in a, in a customer's life. And so the fact that you advertised a great deal and communicated it with a funny ad, but then the product wasn't actually available or accessible at the price that you advertised it or at the volume that you advertised it, or indeed somebody bought that product, but the actual product didn't turn out to work the way it needed to turn out. Those cycles are now infinitesimally smaller and faster. So we're seeing the rate of change increase and the scale and impact of change increase, which I think a lot of businesses uh, are struggling to grapple with because it is changing the way, the hardest thing is to externalize the problem and make it about the customer. A much harder thing is to internalize that problem and understand how you have to change in order to serve that customer. We've spoken a lot about um, technology and heard about how technology can help or hinder creativity. What's your experience of this at the moment? My sense is, you know, uh, I think creativity uh, is an innate human uh, is an innate human ability, and it's always better in the context of some medium. So I can't think of you know, very many creative people in, in history, you know, whether math was the medium or, or engineering was the medium or indeed advertising and communication or, or art was the medium. There was always a medium attached to creativity. And for me, in that context, technology is providing a much richer, much more diverse canvas for people who want to be creative. I do think from the perspective of our industries, I think we have to widen the definition of creativity to allow it to be more inclusive and bring more people into the conversation as opposed to the kind of classic assumption that creativity is somehow owned by the people who, who, who call themselves creative or who are called creative by, uh, by the model as we understand it today. Some of the most creative companies in the world are fusing skills like metals engineering and design with amazing communication, with really complex engineering. And the creativity that that brings out, from my perspective, is far richer than the kind of traditional linear form of creativity, no matter which discipline you, uh, you come at it from. You've mentioned that you have conversations with CEOs, CIOs, CMOs, um, and they're all a bit more clued up now when sure. it comes to brand awareness and sure. how to project their brand. What's the future of agencies? How, does the, how, do, how do agencies' roles need to change? Yeah, I mean, you know, from my perspective, I think our industry is going through as much disruption as, as any. And you know, I think if for anybody who who's part of an agency uh, business of any description, I think is facing that that challenge. And I think it comes back to the core idea behind the word agency is to essentially act as an agent for the organization that you are serving to help them be successful in what is a far more complex world than thinking about the very narrow space that has been allocated to agencies in the traditional definition of marketing and communications. My belief is, like I said before, brand and, 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 and people who represent the customer are only going to become more important. But what it's going to take to serve those people as their remits widen is going to require agencies to significantly broaden the skill sets, the capabilities, but also think about new business models. Because I actually think that one of the biggest challenges in the agency space is we're still constrained by the traditional model of basically talking about you know, people times 
cost equals, mm. uh, you know, people times rate equals a cost for a particular ask, which is a very classical effort-based model. And I think far more the conversation has to shift towards outcomes and thinking about how we can help some of these businesses drive outcomes in a more meaningful way and be confident enough in our ability to get compensated on the basis of those outcomes. Now, I, I've been in many conversations when you have a really good approach or regular strategy and the client says, I'd much rather pay you for the effort, thank you very much, because the outcomes are gonna cost me a lot more. But I think more and more that, that conversation is one we have to be in. Uh, because I think it, uh, it determines how much belief we have in our ability to actually generate or create that value. I have loads more questions, but I've got the feeling that people will have questions for you, Nigel. Does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to continue because I've got loads to ask. Come on, really? <laughs> Do you know, they're thinking about the party tonight. Right. I'm sure <coughs> Business transformation. <clears throat> I was reading, reading out your, your title. Why is business transformation in your title? Surely that's just uh, assumed, isn't it? Oh, well, it is. It is definitely assumed. And in, in my case, it, in, specifically, it's just designed to engender a focus on us making sure that we're trying to help our clients be more transformative. And we're thinking about new business models, new approaches, new skill sets, which, which we might not typically have brought together in order to engender that outcome. So it's designed to act more as a catalyst as opposed to a... Uh, uh, you know, a permanent state. So give me, give me an insight into your day job then, what, how business transformation kind of works in your, your day job to transform the agency. Well, yeah, I, I, think there's, I think there's two things, right? My day job almost always starts with a client and a problem, and then reflecting on that client problem in the context of how we might go about approaching those. And almost every interaction leaves me recognizing that their businesses are significantly impacted by all the change they see around them, which in turn impacts our business materially in the way that we need to step up to help address some of those challenges and, uh, and, and issues. And as I, you know, I just came from, uh, from, from meeting the CEO of a very large uh, uh, company just this morning in, in, the, uh, in the financial services space. And, and the business as it stands is going through a huge challenge with regulation, changing consumer behavior, the need to be more efficient in cost, not just in the context of marketing, but in the context of the business more broadly, um, and prioritizing investments, and, and in that context, to identify a path through which um, we can help identify where and which strategic priorities we might be the right partner for or against those is a constant reflection on the capabilities and the ability we have today and the capabilities and ability we'll need tomorrow to start to address some of those things. Um, huge challenges, disruption, competition, these are words that are bandied around the industry, um, and rightly so, around many industries. Um, we started the day um, with Lorna Halting, who um, had a phrase, she, she described optimism as a muscle you can train. Yep. How optimistic are you at this moment in time about driving your vision forward and that for others in this room can do the same? I'm very optimistic. I think it's, there's never been a better time to be alive in the context of our industry. In, in the context of the world, it's a different question. But in the context <laughs> of what we do specifically in, in our business, you know, we're seeing more innovation, more change, more in terms of expectations from customers. And I think if you, you can take a look at this and go, you know, change is really hard and, and you know, this is really going to be disruptive or difficult, or you can kind of lean into it, looking at it as an opportunity to, to step up and do something that perhaps you might not have done historically. And I think for, for all of us in the space, I think we're about to kind of go into a, a, you know, a, a period of time, and we probably are already in that period of time, where we're going to see a really big opportunity to step up and play a much more strategic role in the partnership of our clients' businesses. Um, and of course, the downside of any of those changes is you know, not doing that correspondingly, I think, changes very significantly how they go about thinking about their partners. It's a good note to end on, Nigel. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, thank you for your time. Nigel Vance, thank you.